छोटा मुँह और बड़ी बात हुई नात हुई छोटा मुँह आज पे औकात हुई Honorable Representative of Dr. Arsene, Mr. Moeyuddin, Mr. Secretary H.C. Sen, Worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Khalid. It is my pleasure to speak a few words to this esteemed house in attending of the International Media Conference on the post-truth era trends in media. There can be many motives and missions for organizing an international conference, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. We all know that world over people are coping up with very difficult time. Globally, media is playing an active role in transmitting information, interpreting the knowledge, and communicating precautionary measures regarding the pandemic. However, we have also seen that media did not just become actively functional for transmitting news regarding the virus and related issues. It also became a space where non-credible news exists and people believe in it too for so many reasons. Post-truth dynamics shows that scandals and controversies bring traffic and TRPs, where an incomplete news gives the complete essence to its readers, where an interpretative content seems final and legitimate, where users-generated content or participatory journalism seems authentic, and overall, where people believe in each story because of its presentation or boldness. Globally, fake news is considered a measure to distinguish the pre-truth and the post-truth era in real means clickbaiting and thumbnails have eradicated the neutrality and objectivity of these stories. On the other hand, communication has become more diverse than ever. The advance in technology paved the way for digital media to have a major influence on society with their strengths. This two-day international conference will surely make us understand the consequences, perspective, and the challenges of post truth era and the trends that are shaping the media nationally and globally with valuable inputs from our respected guests, media scholars, and faculty. I would like to personally welcome each one of you to the post-truth era trends in media. It's an exciting time for mass communication as we continue to grow and adapt, the rem adapt and remain always motivated. The discipline of mass communication is confronted with many changes, and we are meeting these changes during a time of larger nationwide and global change. The world of mass media and journalism is an exciting area, and activities like these make it more exciting. We will continue to meet and bring inspired people together on forums like this to ensure mass communication remains at the cutting edge. Before I close, I would like to thank all of you, especially Ms. Seema Mughal, for collaboration with us and for attending our conference and bringing your expertise to our gathering. I want to especially welcome those who have come from other cities and countries and wish them a pleasant stay in Karachi. I'm really thankful to Higher Education Commission SIN, Greenwich University, IPS, AIMS, and Guru Ultra for their support. Our Vice Chancellor and Dean Faculty of Arts at Organizing Leader have the vision and the knowledge. We could not accomplish that what we do without your support and leadership. Throughout this conference, I ask you to stay engaged, keep us proactive, and help us shape the future of mass communication. My personal respect and thanks go out to you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauzi Anas. Guests, to please uh, stand up for our national anthem. The Vice Chancellor of Greenwich University, Seema Mughal, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Moin, Secretary to SIN HUC, keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Lee Arts, distinguished speakers, chairperson, mass communication, Dr. Fauzi Nas, media persons, faculty members, students, 
and ladies and gentlemen assalamu alaikum and very good morning to all it gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome you here today at the international media conference 2022 organized by the department of mass communication university of karachi this international conference is a proof of the department relentless efforts to provide a useful platform to leading international or national scholars researchers media practitioners and students of the mass communication to share their valuable knowledge express their opinions and analyze the current trends of the media industries ladies and gentlemen we have been also able to gather here today is because of the endless support offered by the sin hc in making this conference possible it is my earnest hope that this collaboration between karachi university and the sin hc continues in the future to has en enabling us to have more of such wonderful learning opportunities thank you thank you mr moin moreover i would like uh, i would also like to thanks greenwich university for collaborating with us i am also thankful to keynote speaker professor dr lee director of the department of communication at purdue university northwest who graciously accepted our invitations to become a part of this international conference with his impressive work in the area of political communication media framing and the role of media in social justice social movement and political economy there couldn't have been a better person to inaugurate today's session which deals with a very crucial situation facing us media and the post truth era thank you dr arts for your participation in our conference ladies and gentlemen the rapid spread of the social media has made it difficult for a lay person to distinguish between truth and lies the fact that the media consumers of yesterday years is also a contents creators in today's world has further muddied an already murky media situation it has become a difficult to sift the truth from the various shades of half truth and absolutely lies which dominate the media contents today's conference is therefore an efforts to search for the lost truth we have invited the leading names from the academia as well as industries professionals to sit together discuss the shades of the issues at hand and share their views and hopefully find some solutions we have high expectations from our our learned guest that they will have answers to the questions which are often raised in this respect just like the problem does not exist in isolation the solution has to be found through our joint efforts in the end i would like to thanks the vice chancellor university of karachi professor dr khalid mahmood raki for his endless support and corporations which made this day possible i would like also to congratulate the chairperson dr fazia naz and her entire team of the department of mass communication for working tirelessly with full determination i wish you all the best and expect that you will continue to hold such events in future as well as thank you very much Vice Chancellor of University of Karachi, Greenwich University, the Dean of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, the Sint Office of Higher Education, and of course the Department of Mass Communication here at the University of Karachi, Dr. Fauzi, for inviting me, Dr. Sadia, who made it possible for me to get my visa, get here, and made all the arrangements, and thank you all of my colleagues and student participants that are here. What I want to bring to you is not uh, some insight based on things that i have looked at or research but what i want to offer is some observations that i hope can become part of the dialogue over the next couple of days our first task here as far as i can see is to define fake news i say that fake news is nothing more than news about events and persons that is false and misleading normally we call that lies post truth on the other hand is the larger social climate whereby certain publics objective facts are less persuasive and acceptable than appeals to their emotion and their personal beliefs 
To be able to discuss fake news and the post-truth era, I think it's important that we describe the sources, the rise, and the influence of post-truth information on these various publics. The practice of fake news and the condition of post-truth politics can only develop under specific material and historical conditions. To fully understand the rise of misinformation and lies as political weapons, we need a robust historical framing that considers the larger context, the technological context, the economic context, the political context, and the social cultural context, which is how I have organized my presentation. But first, I want to begin, um, inspired in part by what the dean just said, is that we, in our contemporary world, there has been many changes. But we live in a contemporary world with rising economic inequality resulting from the globalization of neoliberal capitalism that has expanded globally. Governments on every continent have accepted privatization of public resources and services and simultaneously instituted cutbacks in public service from pensions, health care, education, and public media, among others. Austerity programs have been supplemented by well-funded and well-organized political agents intent on fomenting polarization through distraction and spectacle. Significantly, all of this, the austerity, the inequality, and the political hyperpartisanship has been greatly aided by commercial media, including social media, seeking larger audiences to sell to advertisers. Notably, our current social context is marked by a decline in respect for science, respect for civility, and respect for democracy writ large. Under these conditions, false charges that something that discomforts me is fake could almost be predicted as partisan preferences replace evidence. My larger point here is that misinformation, lies, cannot be explained as the failure of uneducated individuals or put down to some sudden and inexplicable post-truth social climate. Reality still exists. Our experiences and meanings may vary, but none can be considered beyond truth or irrelevant to truth, nor can our knowledge about the world or our behavior in response to those conditions be corrected or improved simply by improving communication. Indeed, at this moment, polarization has created epistemologies that ignore science, rational argument, and conventional organized standards of evidence. What has been termed post-truth is the result of organized and financed competing regimes of meaning and understanding that's based on fear and wishful thinking. So we begin with technology, the context of technology. Granted, social media must be seen as a primary means of communication that allows, even pushes, fake news and false narratives. Four billion people use social media, posting 500 million tweets a day one billion YouTube videos, and sharing 10 billion Facebook shares every single day. That confirms that social media is a major means of communication. The original hopeful appraisals of social media that it would expand intercultural democratic discourse has been replaced by funny animal clips and TikTok dances and personal updates on dining and shopping. Of greater concern, obviously, is the outlandish an incendiary racist, nationalist, and anti-religion posts that attract and enrage millions. My point here is that this is not the exclusive result of social media. Closing down all social media would not secure peace or end world hunger. Social media is the means of communication, not the author. In fact, social media do not have news production. They scrape that from the commercial media. Twitter needed Trump's daily missiles of lies in order to expand their audience. Social media are aggregators of other news sources. Most importantly, social media do not have to function as they currently do. The digital technology could be structured in different ways and used in different ways. It's just that currently, the leading technology is owned and designed by corporate engineers to maintain our attention and induce users to stay connected so they can deliver us to advertisers. 
and their drive for profits, social media has carefully designed their sites to attract and hold our attention, often through spectacle and wild assertions that prompt surprise and sometimes irritation. We know about algorithms, we know about cookies, we aren't that familiar with beacons or fingerprints. Such practices allow corporations, advertisers, and even the government to monitor user activity. Social media promote these activities to engage us, to monitor us, and through spectacle and irritation and surprise. These are structured commercial operations that end up promoting misinformation, polarization, and uncivil behavior as a means to attract users. I want to be clear here that the technological applications and media platforms are currently privately held and controlled. Twitter limits the number of characters you can put in a tweet. Google ranks your search requests. TikTok and YouTube set time restrictions. The point is social media is confined to short posts, emojis, brief comments that can express irritation, anger, and disbelief. But as it's currently structured, public access, promotion, and all the media use depend on who owns that technology. And that's not just social media. That's true for radio. That's true for television. That's true for print. That's true for entertainment. Billions of users are constrained by these limited structures and processes determined by a handful of corporations. The social relations that owners and users recreate are the social relations that are similar between corporate owners and their working employees. We must work under the terms set by the management. In fact, when we talk about social media, we work for free. We create content that's used to attract other users to those sites. So I would conclude that technology, the context of technology, is directly, directly related to the economic context. <coughs> We live in a world where the development practice and public access to media are the outcome of capitalist economic systems. This is true for traditional commercial media as well. In fact, for all media, the terms of use, the structure of the practices, and the limited public interest are determined by consolidated corporate ownerships. For social media, it's designed to benefit the corporation and the platforms. Facebook, Baidu, MailRU, and others. This is important because every, every single social media application is dependent upon one or more corporate-owned platforms, despite whatever affiliations may exist among the users. The accumulation of this online capital is largely economic in nature, resulting in the exacerbation of exploitation, alienation, and conspicuous prosumption consumption and production of consumption. In 2018, the Canadian researcher Kane Foucher published a book called Social Capital, which is available online with a free PDF if anyone is interested. He found several conclusions that coincide with these observations that I just made. He says, one, social media sites monitor and convert our interactions into the commodity of data, which is then sold to advertisers. Two, he said that social media commodify users, commodify ourselves doing the work of the sites through the production and consumption of content. And as we're engaged in these acts of accumulation through labor, narcissism and aggression become more prominent. This network spe spectacle maintains this social enclosure, accelerating alienation between us, among us, so that what we can see, say, or do is prescribed by the applications and the networks. Concluding this section, social media may live in a cloud, but they work on the ground of corporate control. It's not a virtual reality. You can see the buildings that house all of the equipment that makes necessary this, and the rules and the regulations are by a corporate control that favors a business model with algorithms pushing spectacle that exploits the existing social divide for profit. So that's our technological context, our economic context. The political context for, for fake news in a post-truth world is the result of regulations and laws by politicians and governments 
that are enforced by government agencies serving corporate economic interests. This is not just neoliberal globalization, but specific political practices and social relations of power unique to each nation state, including, I would note, Pakistan, politically as a means for actual democratic discussion and collaboration and decision making, current media structures in every nation interfere with healthy public communication. Media frame the news, and they politically favor and restrict or censor sites or don't allow us on television, on radio. Um, when I was in Lahore, I asked students how many people here have produced a television show since yesterday? How many people here have had a radio program? How many people here have produced a movie? There was an occasionally a few people that had done some music, but the rest of us, that means we're what? We are spectators by someone else's decision. Just in the last year, the big media companies have followed government directives in Bangladesh, Congo, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Chad, Kazakhstan, Ethiopia, China, Sri Lanka, I can't keep reading the list, that they've been shut down or slowed because the media companies accepted the political decisions by that government. Internationally, all social media regularly shut down their applications. And we know that governments restrict the traditional journalists from even being on site to cover the news. Unfortunately, under this guise of curtailing hate speech and violence in the United States, for instance, Google and Facebook removed labor, anti-war, pro-democracy, indigenous, African-American, and women's sites, burying them from view, essentially telling the public that our actions as private owners will determine the public debate. Meanwhile, commercial media and politicians have charged social media as the problem, obscuring and ignoring the long history and continued practice of publicizing fake news by traditional commercial media. Indeed, I would argue that the record shows that social media did not invent fake news. Fake news has been around for decades. Consider just a few of the more dramatic examples. Jean-Marie Le Pen in France uses media interviews and rallies to foment race hatred. Modi uses TV broadcasts to stir anti-Muslim sentiment in India. Oban controls the television in Hungary to promote and uh, to undermine democracy. And I would ask you to think of some recent events that are pre-social media. The war in Iraq was based upon the false claim, the lies, that there were weapons of mass destruction and that Iraq had anything at all to do with the events. <laughs> ABC aired shortly after that lies about Iraqi soldiers toppling baby incubators in Kuwait, which enraged the public and said, we need to go to war. The Associated Press released fabrications that Secretary Clinton said were Viagra-fueled rapes in Libya, justifying the US bombing. The US and EU have televised broadcasts from USAID finance videos claiming government brutality in Venezuela. And videos created by Britain's White Helmets claim Syria used chemical weapons against its people. In each case, these TV stories, these print stories, these radio stories were debunked by the United Nations, Amnesty International, and independent journalists as fabrications and lies. And I repeat, all of this without the benefit of social media. And there are probably many more examples from almost every nation coinciding with the political priorities of the national politicians. In sum, the su structures and practices of corporate-owned technology, the economics of neoliberal capitalism, and the political leadership provided by national governments and domestic political parties all contribute to the social-cultural context of fake news. As I suggested earlier, unequal societies with unequal access to resources and media results in those social conditions providing the fertile ground for fake news and the cultivation of post-truth perspectives. The conditions of inequality, ethnic discrimination, and the hardships of daily life create great anxiety, personal stress, psychological anguish, all of which are exacerbated by organized political groups and promoted by commercial media. 
In other words, this is more than out of control social media stirring up rabid hatred and incivility. Elite politicians, corporate backed think tanks and PR campaigns, commercial media and corporate controlled social media combine to erode the public's trust in facts and reality such that facts don't matter, alternative facts are valid, misinformation reigns, and we enter a manufactured post-truth era. Notably, this is the norm for all media, whether you consider some liberal or conservative. The New York Times regularly distorts news about Israel's occupation of Palestine, about US military interventions and actions from Iraq and Afghanistan wars to the US attacks on Syria and Pakistan to the military standoffs currently with Russia and China. This is the liberal press in the United States. More importantly, for media framing and agendas to attract audiences, the social and cultural ground for the reception of fake news must be tellable. Under severe economic and political conditions that threaten or even appear to threaten individuals and groups, lies will spread due to the collective fear and anxiety of those social groups as they react emotionally to their condition. But this is orchestrated. I'll just give you one small example. After the occupation of the US Congress on January 6th, 700 corporations in the United States gave more than $20 million to 130 Congress people that supported that occupation. That was financed by 700 corporations. Recent research into Pakistan media that I read in preparing for this conference concluded that corporate media influence news content and owners have employed non-journalistic personalities who function as, quote, puppet journalists. I'm stressing here that the existing structures and practices of corporate-owned media technology combined with economic inequality and concerted political actions in defense of social power has consequences for the public for the average citizen, and for our social relations. An MIT study found that false news was retweeted 70% more often than accurate reports. Why? Because lies have novelty and promote stronger reactions, which is beneficial to Twitter. Getting media users riled up creates more online engagement for the platform. But I hasten to add, a similar study at the same time from Princeton and NYU found that only 10% of social media users actually share posts. The people that share may share more often fake news, but 90% of the people don't share what they read on social media. Meanwhile, well-funded academic think tanks such as the Heritage Foundation, Brookings, Cato, the American Enterprise Institute, and they're in every country around the world, interfere with any attempt to improve communication when they offer indefensible research pushing climate change denial, election theft, anti-vaccination claims, and racist tropes. In other words, the technological, the economic, the political, and the social context suggests that misinformation is not simply lazy readers or rabid conspiracy theorists, but the outcome of orchestrated and politicized media campaigns that promote alternative views dismissing standards of rational discourse, evidence, and factual argument. Those are our conditions globally. In the United States, there has not been a wage raise since when I was a machinist many years ago. There has been no increase for the average wage for the average working person in the United States in more than 60 years. Today in the United States, eight people, eight people have the same wealth as 50% of the population. As a result, our social capital has declined dramatically. Goodwill, empathy, trust among citizens, civic engagement has been shoved aside by our personal anxieties, our fear, our self-interest, our distrust, and national hatred for other cultures and persons. Almost to be expected, cooperation and happiness has declined. I don't think that it's possible that Pakistan will be immune to this. Some 650,000 Pakistanis, about 1% of the population, capture 30% of the national income every year. 
32 million Pakistanis, half of the population, collectively earn less than 11% of the national income. As reported in the Pakistan press just last April, Pakistan has the second lowest human development index value among South Asia, creating those same real social conditions for extreme political and social reaction. I would say around the world, the greater a country's economic inequality, the greater the polarization. And it's not immediately directed at those eight people in the United States or the 1% in any particular country, but at cultural others who are often worse off than the national cultural majority. Just witness this region. Think about India, where political leaders have led violent Hindu attacks against Muslims and Sikhs. Look at Myanmar and their assault on the Rohingya. Look at Turkey and the recurring attacks on the Kurds, or China's restrictions on the Uyghur, Uyghur minority. I know there's millions of people from Afghanistan that have fled uh, since, since the changes over the last dozen years even. And I just wonder how long it will be before Afghan refugees become fodder for some Pakistani ultra-nationalist rhetoric. The point here is not to condemn anybody, but to note that this is not just gri groups drifting apart. And this is not a natural, racial, cultural, or religious divide. Rather, the evidence indicates that decades-long concerted efforts by political operatives and think tanks foment distrust and hatred of the most marginalized groups, using language and themes that disparage and blame others. Industry-based disinformation filtered and promoted by major commercial media has cultivated this post-truth culture that rejects evidence, science, and facts in general. Within this emerging world, comforting inaccurate beliefs dominate, even when relative, relevant evidence is available, understood, and tolerated. In short, artificially constructed alternative ways of knowing provide the filter bubbles that interfere with public discourse and rational civil discussion. A post-truth environment dissuades people from participating in public discussions and encourages a feeling of powerlessness. The world becomes almost unknown or unknowable. A post-truth environment disguises and allows illegal U.S. drone attacks, corporate and government corruption in every nation, and further cuts to social services in the public interest. Alienated and agitated publics are continuously encouraged to remain volatile by media, propaganda campaigns, and rabid politicians, pushing many more of us to become disinterested and avoiding politics altogether. <coughs> While advocating and implementing techniques for challenging misinformation and identifying inconsistencies and logical flaws in arguments will be useful, there are much larger issues to address. So what can be done? I have no grand solution, but I would suggest, most importantly, the public needs access to produce and distribute its own media. Cooperative, citizen-based community groups must own and control their own media, radio, television, and digital communication. The experiences of community media in Latin America and elsewhere provide useful and hopeful examples of how to get past misinformation by relying on community-based producers and sources rather than paid experts connected to corporate interests. This is more than public service media like the BBC or PTV. This would be public controlled and produced media without an administrative layer of commercial or government interest. Post-truth information has been designed and used as a spoke screen to divert attention from strategic political actions and challenges. Fake news is indeed a rational strategy by political forces seeking corporate objectives at the expense of the public interest. Fortunately, I would say that history shows that reality ultimately amplifies the social contradictions that can expose those inaccurate beliefs and experiences. In the United States, fires, floods, hurricanes, and droughts are answering all the climate change naysayers. As citizens lose their homes, lives, and livelihoods, fake news fails. In the meantime, we can't wait for our individual experiences to expose those misinformation and lies. 
We cannot rely on corporate media for accurate reporting of our social conditions or framing our experiences. I would say the public needs our own social movement organizations and community controlled media outlets to share our experiences and decide with others which policies and practices will contribute to a humane world with a diverse yet shared goals that speak truth for humanity. Rahim, Vice Chancellor, University of Karachi, Secretary HEC, Dean of Arts, Chairperson of Department of Mass Communication, national and international speakers, distinguished guests, faculty and students, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be here on this international media conference. Congratulations to the Mass Communication and Department of Karachi University. I'm also very happy to see that Greenwich University's Mass Communication and Media Studies Department has extended the technical and academic expertise jointly holding this conference. Now I'm not at all an expert in the media affairs. But as an educator, I can appreciate the importance of the media literacy in these times. Times where we are bombarded with information without an accurate check on propaganda, misinformation, sensationalism, and fake news. I'll be brief, ladies and gentlemen. Fake news is affecting all of us today, even in the most celebrated democracies. The American elections of 2016 were marred with allegations of the Russian influence through misinformation campaign on social media. In our own backyard, we learned through fact checkers such as EU Disinfo Alert of a sophisticated 15 year global disinformation campaign to serve interest of our enemies. The range of manipulation is extraordinary here and so is the gulf between the contrary narratives. From individual defamation campaigns to entire foreign policy formulations, we continue to be swept away by unchecked propaganda designed to achieve dangerous outcomes. The examples are many, but I'm sure we all know. And it's a high time that we do some soul searching to jolt our conscience as a society and a global community. Allow me to put this into perspective. Media traditionally has served as the venue guard for countering misinformation and creating an informed society based on journalistic ethic. Today, however, commercialization of media has turned news into a commodity driven by the logic of profits over integrity. Classical liberal ideals are overtaken by new liberalism Greed. Conferences such as this and educational establishments at large need to initiate the discourse around that so we can revitalize the value systems we all cherish. Let me put forth some food for thought. In the post-truth world, it needs to start with ethical reforms in our media education. We need to revitalize journalistic ethics around board. We need to inculcate critical reflection, coherent articulation, and conscious validations as principles of our media production. What is consumed is produced. If we need to expose and confront fake news, we must create the appreciation of quality news. While we celebrate freedom of thought and expression, we also need to balance it with regulation, enough to ensure that our moral and factual compass is intact. How can we radically broaden journalism and media education in Pakistan? This is something I hope the participants will learn 
from this conference, from the speakers. We must continue to invite scholars from diverse backgrounds to learn best practices in reforming Pakistan media sector. The plenary sessions along with presentations of research paper in the coming two days will be exciting and interesting. And I believe the things which I have gone through, the information which I have got is that the sessions are going to have on misinformation and fake news, challenges for modern democracy. Fifth generation warfare, hate speech and challenges for governance, post-truth politics and communication along with digital media opportunities and threats. Narratives around foreign policies, issues, and journalism practices in the era of post-truth are some of the topics which are going to be addressed by the speakers in the coming two days. I would like to congratulate the conference committee on organizing this very timely international media conference. Karachi University's mass communication and media department is one of the oldest in Pakistan and mainly responsible for producing a generation of old school South Asian journalists. Congratulations on holding this conference and I'm looking forward to have more collaborative conferences, workshops and seminars with University of Karachi. Thank you for having me this morning. Stay blessed. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Seema Mughal, Vice Chancellor at Greenwich University. Um, I'd like to now invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. M. Iraqi, uh, for his presidential address. Ladies and gentlemen, give him a big hand. Our patron and our Vice Chancellor, Professor. Department of Mass Communication, the Dean, Arts and Social Sciences the resource persons, the faculty members, and students. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, for me, it is indeed an honor to be part of this event, focusing about post-truth era and trends. Uh, I think today even we'll discuss the different aspects of media. A media which we claim to be the fourth pillar of his state, but claiming to be the fourth pillar of the state is not enough. It's about delivering. It's about function. I claim that I am the most important son of my mother, but my father does not understand. Why does not understand? So we can ask our, my mother. Okay. <laughs> but... I think I am not expert the way the keynote speaker talk about the media, talking about justice, inequality, talking about uh, the uh, induction of new technologies in, 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 in order to respond to the new development. But I was a student of mass communication way back in uh, 1983. And I studied two courses in media that was called journalism. Or us buniyat par mein apne aap ko thoda tagda samajhto. So when I talk about post-truth trend in media, I think we have to have understanding about in order to have a media photograph, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so w when the topic is about post-truth era trends in media, I think we have to have an understanding about post-truth politics, post-factual politics, and post-reality policies. Because 
the post truth is respond to this political culture. The culture I think which is started way back in 2016. Uh, the keynote speaker mentioned about different examples, but I want to quote the example of the debate which is started in America way back in 2016 about former President Barack Obama. Okay, whether he was a Muslim or not, whether he was a natural citizen born of Indi uh, America, uh, think about a developed nation where everything is computerized, everything is documented, and still there was a debate that Obama was a natural American citizen. In the context of Pakistan, we claim our media to be responsible and providing a correct information. But what about the developed nation? I think the another example was Brexit. About European Union, Britain leaving EU. And then another example is Modi and what is happening in Kashmir. So these are the examples in terms of post-truth era. Now the question is, ke is post-truth era ke andar, what is going on? What is happening? My humble submission is, jab riyasat tanqeed ko accept na kare, tanqeed ko bardash na kare, to phir post-truth develop hoti. Right? State has to deliver. It is, we have the right to criticize the state. We means the media personnel. We means the common people. We means the policy makers. We have the right to criticize state and government. Allah Mia ne nahi bana ke diya. Kyunki Allah Mia, meri walda kehti, Allah Mia se koi shikayat na karo. Par main government se to shikayat kar sakta hoon. Main riyasat se shikayat kar sakta hoon. And the, when the government failed to deliver when they fail to promote the democratic process, it's about freedom of opinion, the freedom of expression. Then this campaign is going on. Post-truth era. Right? It's not a one-sided story, ladies and gentlemen. We put to put blames on media about this particular development. But I believe it, it is the state and it is the government and it is the corporate sector, they have to take the blame as well. Right? Fake news, the term, I think, when I was watching television, when Donald Trump became the president of the United States of America, and he'll start talking about the fake news and the fake news. Uh, th there was mention about journalistic ethical values. Yes. But I am totally against the concept called regulation of media. Right? Let the media be free and put your argument on the basis of facts. Dunya mein ek cheez Jiske par dispute nahi ho sakti, jisko deny nahi kar sakte, that is called facts. Okay. I may claim myself ke mein toh bhoat sharif aadmi hoon, par danga mein karta hoon, fasad mein karta hoon. <laughs> so, there is a responsibility on the part of media 
that they should have their stories, their news on the basis of research, on the basis of facts. Unfortunately, aaj ki jo media hai, because of the corporate sector attitude, paisa nahi lagate in term of research ke upar. Paisa nahi lagate in term of investigation ke upar. The corporate sector believe in breaking news. Thik hai? Wo chahe thik ho ya galat ho. Aaj kal ka bahut zyada mauzu hai Pinky sahiba Islamabad mein rehti ya nahi rehti. But I am more concerned about my state. I am more concerned about the common people. I am more concerned about the economic condition of Pakistan. The COVID has hit everyone, including Pakistan. But the inflation is flying like a rocket. The people in some capital, maybe living in a different world, say, sab kuch theek hai. But I live with the common people. Jahan ruzana kiemte bar lengi. Thik hai. So, meri is conference say, what are the expectations? Expectation, there are different very important subjects focusing about the fake news, the democracy, uh, digitalization, using technologies. I hope meri student, aapke presentation say, uh, फायदा उठाएंगे एंड प्लीज जो भी कॉन्टेक्स्ट हो हम एग्जांपल्स दें विद रेफरेंस टू पाकिस्तान सो दैट वी हैव मोर अंडरस्टैंडिंग अबाउट हाउ वी आर गोइंग टू रिस्पॉन्ड टू दिस पर्टिकुलर सिचुएशन आई वाज सपोज्ड टू बी अ प्रेसिडेंट प्रेसिडेंशियल एड्रेस पर मेरी थोड़ी सी ये है कि मैं अपनी एक्सपर्टीज को जाहिर करना चाहता हूं expertise in term of uh, the media i think pakistan may there is a need to have reforms in our media sector one unfortunately media itna hi ho gaya hai ki ek cameraman hai वो हर किसी से आपकी राय ले रहा होता है एंड उस बुनियाद पर खबर बन जाती है दैट्स नॉट इनफ यू नीड एक्सपर्ट इन द फील्ड ऑफ मीडिया और उनके अपने एरियाज होते हैं पाकिस्तान में अनफॉर्चुनेटली हम अपने जर्नलिस्ट से मीडिया पर्सन से एक्सपेक्ट करते हैं कि वो दुनिया के तमाम इशूज के ऊपर तमाम लूम के ऊपर राय दे सकता है तहकीक कर सकता है जिस तरीके से मैं समझता हूं कि मैं हर मौजू पे बोल सकता हूं थैंक यू लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ऑफ दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन स्टूडेंट्स अस्सलाम वालेकुम व रहमतुल्लाह इट्स रियली एन ऑनर फॉर मी टू बी पार्ट ऑफ दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस Chairperson Sindh HEC wanted to join this conference but due to his meeting in Islamabad he could not attend On behalf of Sindh Higher Education Commission I congratulate Dr Fauzia and her team to conduct such organization and I hope that the faculty members participants and the students will have the opportunity to learn uh, the knowledge shared by the national and international speakers from different parts of the world as you know that sindh higher education commission has started supporting universities for the conduct of conferences from last year this year sindh hcc has approved uh, 16 international conferences for different public sector universities and sindh and i assure full support to all universities for the conduct of different programs in future also in the end i once again uh, congratulate dr fauzia and her team